Tēnā koto katoa and hello everybody. Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. My name is Ben Adelberg and I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makoro, Auckland. And g'day, I'm Emma Strutt and I'm currently coming to you from Gungaloo country in Queensland. And before we dive into our conversation today, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. The Lento Intervention is an Australasian educational and advocacy platform dedicated to raising awareness about the current climate and health crisis. And on this podcast, we invite guests to chat about topics that will inspire you to take action to improve your own health and the health of the planet. So please subscribe to and share this podcast. Visit our website for the full show notes. And don't forget to buy us a coffee if you'd like to support our work. Right, season two, episode 39. I'm really excited to get into the behind the scenes with this conversation. So without ado, Emma, let's get straight into it. All right, so today we are very lucky to be joined by two amazing guests, Amy Taylor and Chris Huiwai, who are both part of the team that brought to life the new documentary Milked, which is exposing the whitewash of New Zealand's multi-billion dollar dairy industry. So both Amy and Chris have extremely impressive CVs and backstories, but I won't give too much away. I'll let them fill you in on that. Chris, Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. And Chris, apologies for my very lazy Australian tongue there. I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation of your last name. I was practicing off air, but I just can't get it. I'm sorry. Kapai. Tēnā koe, Emma, and tēnā koe, Ben. All goods. It's Chris Hudiwai. Kia ora mai tātou. Hi, ko Chris Hudiwai. Aho. No na pui nati pro me ti ati awa aho. Um, uh, from Northland up north, but also got links to the east coast and west coast of Aotearoa. So, um, yeah, that's me. Um, I'll let Amy give a little bit about herself. How do I follow that? Um, kia ora, I'm Amy oh. from Coromandel. <laughs> it's pretty much all I've got to say there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, from sorry. the Coromandel. <laughs> Cheers, great to be here. Thanks, guys. No, that's awesome. Um, look, let, let's carry on with, with your introductions. Just like with all, all podcast interviews, um, we'd love to learn first about uh, our guests, uh, their backgrounds. Uh, both of you um, are in, in, in sort of the whole journey to, to veganism and, and advocacy around that. And also, we'd love to get a little insight into how the two of you got together with uh, this project. So, Amy, let's take it away. Yeah, well, I've got a bit of a long history with um, veganism. It's been about 30 years now that I've um, been vegan, kind of started when I was in my late teens and was a volunteer for SAFE way back in the day in Christchurch. And um, and then I ended up doing a thesis on veganism and opened a vegan cafe and kind of the filmmaking kicked in when I was doing wildlife filmmaking and then I thought I should use the filmmaking skills to make films with a vegan message. Um, so that's kind of how Chris and I met, was in 2018, I think it was, we did a short film. I'd kind of discovered his activism and pretty much we just did a short film together called The Cube of Truth um, and got talking about this project. Wow. Chris? Yeah, um, so my background, um, before I got into animal rights activism, I worked for a Māori health organisation, Te Hauoro Ngāpui, in Te Tai Tokiro, um, where I was able to go into schools and engage with rangatahi, mainly teaching them about physical education and healthy eating. Um, at the time, my main uh, kaupapa that I was rolling out in the schools was teaching kids how to ride unicycles, <laughs> which uh, I know sounds really strange, but it's um, a great activity, um, not just to get people active, but it works both sides of the brain and it's good for goal setting. And um, I acted as a kind of uh, role model in the community, trying to uh, build healthy, vibrant community action uh, for about seven or so years. Um, and then after a while doing that, um, I wanted to, I guess, take steps a little bit further in my own life. I turned vegetarian when I was about 13 and I wanted to progress um, with what I had come across, which was veganism, which really caught my attention. And um, yeah, just everything about it uh, totally aligned with me. I actually found um, the work of Mike Joy. He was influential in my decision um, to go vegan and get into advocacy in this space, highlighting issues around the dairy industry. 
Um, I found his work called Squandered, and it just laid out all of the impacts that I was seeing in front of me in, in regards to environmental degradation. And it was that final kicker that I needed um, to motivate myself to take my own aspirations further in terms of um, changing my diet from vegetarian to a vegan diet. Um, and then after going vegan, obviously learning more, because a lot of it's so hidden from us, learning more about what happens to animals within industrialized farming systems. Uh, and then got into, yeah, animal rights activism, um, started doing uh, stuff within the same space as Amy, and then our paths crossed. Um, as she said, we made um, the, the short film Cube of Truth. Um, and yeah, it's all history from there, pretty much. Um, well, look, it, it was uh, quite interesting when I went onto the Milked website. And um, I mean, I think you've played this down very well, Chris, but you know, your unicycling is not just a passion. You were three time world champion. And to read that on your bio, it's like, hang on, where, where does that all fit in? So, you, you know, you, you were quite good at this. Still are, probably. Oh. Yeah, I still, I, it's my main form of exercise, that's for sure. It's my downtime, you know, it's my creative vent. It's, um, uh, it's, it was definitely my biggest passion for a long time before I got involved with animal rights advocacy. Um, but yeah, it, it kept me out of trouble as a kid, that's for sure. When all of my mates were, you know, doing possibly questionable things, I was at the skate park um, honing my craft and, yeah, eventually um, I took my craft overseas, started going to international competitions. Um, I've been, uh, yeah, I can't count the amount of countries that I've been to for competitions, but I've been to three um, world championships. No, about five world championships that I've been to. I've won three of them. Uh, the most recent one that I went to, um, I came third. So, you know, had to let the youngsters, you know, have their time in the sun. You <laughs> have know. a chance, yeah. Um, and the one that I went to previously before that, um, unfortunately, I was injured, which is a shame because I was like kind of still in my prime there, still practicing a lot. Um, but yeah, the last one that I went to, I would say that was when I was more focused on animal rights advocacy. I hadn't been doing too much unicycling, uh, but still able to come away with a third, which, um, yeah, is keeping me happy for now. And Amy, you actually started off by studying environmental science and marine biology, which is pretty cool. So give us a little bit about your backstory there. Yeah, well, I kind of did a whole bunch of things before I got into filmmaking. But um, yeah, for a long time, I was working on boats and working with whales and dolphins, taking people swimming with humpback whales in Tonga and and kind of then decided to learn about um, environmental science and marine biology. So I did that degree. And then I decided science was boring and <laughs> I wanted to do something creative. Um, Don't and, say yeah, that. So very fickle <laughs> for a while with my studies. <laughs> but no, kind of science was boring to me until I discovered filmmaking and realised, you know, documentaries are kind of where it's at. Communicating science in a way that people can understand, I guess. Um, yeah, so I did a, uh, did a postgraduate diploma in science communication, which was basically... Wildlife filmmaking, but um, a little bit more around that as well. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your, what I'm going to call a bit of a dream team here. Um, Peter Eastwood needs no introduction to our show. Uh, he, uh, we've interviewed him, but he's he's put in touch with uh, most, most of the film uh, sort of <clears throat> documentaries that we've interviewed so far. Uh, Michal Suvesky with, with Take Out, Susan Scott, Bonnet de Bod with uh, Struop, uh, Jasmine Duthie, Anton Leach, Lines, Bones and Bullets, and even Kennedy Zakir from the Council of Contributors. Long list, shout out to all of them. Peter put me in touch with you, Amy, at the beginning of the year. He said this new documentary is coming out, it's, it's local, it's Kiwi. Um, you know, we obviously waited um and and then sbs came out with a with a um a little uh, sort of expose of themselves and i thought is this what he was meaning no it can't be and he was like hang on is he stolen their thunder what's going on here mm. um and it's finally come out so peter's involvement we we obviously know he loves supporting these kind of projects but my question is long way to get there how did you get susie cameron and keegan kuhn involved i mean brilliant people to have on the team First of all, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Peter. Like, oh, this film would not have happened if Peter had not reached out to us. So he just contacted us out of the blue, offered his help, didn't ask for much in the way of, um, you know, any anything really, just said, here you go, what can I do to help? So that was just that. 
that made us um, make the film, basically. So, yeah, and and then I guess we started off with such a small, um, small kind of plan, really, because it was just us going around the country, you know, making this kind of film, and then it did it did start exploding from there with um, getting Festival Keegan involved because. Um, that kind of happened by fluke because I'd actually contacted the person who did the music for Cowspiracy, which turned out to be Keegan. Um, so I just sort of said, would you like to do the music for Milked? And he said, yeah, by the way, it's Keegan here. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's a bonus. <laughs> um, and then we pretty much, um, he got more and more involved as he saw the cuts of the film develop and then became executive producer. And then I guess with Susie, it was, um, it just made sense. They were, you know, they had a dairy farm that was transitioning, what pretty much has transitioned completely out of dairy. Um, she's done a lot of work in the plant-based space and she's passionate about the health, the environment, the animals, um, the farmers. So once she saw the cut too, she decided um, to be executive producer. Yeah, so definitely dream team. <laughs> We're still pinching ourselves with all those people involved. So l- let's set the scene a little bit before we dive into the doco. I think given um, our past guests on the podcast, I'm sure most of our regular listeners will be aware that New Zealand is a big dairy country, um, but just how big might be a bit of a surprise for a lot of people. Um I mean, dairy cows were only introduced a little over 200 years ago. So firstly, why do you think that the dairy industry has exploded in such a way in New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, why has it taken such a boom? Why has it become such a boom in Aotearoa? I mean, we have such a temperate climate, a lot of sun and a lot of natural capital, as they say. Um, that's prime to be exploited. Um, this industry has so many externalized costs that can be pushed onto the environment after they've extracted out these natural resources. Um, you know, Kiwis are really innovative and really clever. And so we were able, unfortunately, able to exploit that for capital benefits. And we are now seeing, of course, uh, the blowback effects of that savvy innovation yeah it's come back to bite us in the foot i would say so um a friend of the show a uh, big friend of the show dr mike joy he's been on on our show twice already mm. um and he's certainly educated us um you know mm. those externalities you talk about chris um yeah. it's 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 massive you know massive importer of of, of phosphates uh palm kernel expellents um, you know, the reach of our exports globally, you know, we're a massive contributor to global emissions as well, never mind what we're doing to our internal land, but but external. Um, but give us a little, just a brief, you know, and we're going to get, get into the background of the film. We don't want to go too much into the film itself because we want people to go watch it. But explain to us the, the both the economical, uh, economic and political uh, strength of the dairy industry because it's not just big they actually yield a lot of power within New Zealand as well in terms of policies and in terms of the ability to just get on with what they want to get on with yeah so I just wanted to go back um, you mentioned it a little bit about the fertilizer the palm kernel yeah we're the biggest importers of palm kernel expeller in the world and so we talk a lot about the sustainability of this industry but obviously um, we're having to push out um, our requirement of resources into other countries. We're taking palm kernel uh, from Indonesia. We're taking phosphorus from uh, Western Sahara. Um, and of course, contributing to global um, greenhouse gas emissions. So despite the enormous amount of degradation that we see locally, of course, there is still from this small country, Aotearoa, and so small of a country, still having this massive um, global impact, unfortunately. But yes, as well um, in our political um, system, every time we see legislation that comes forward, whether it's um, you know rules around uh, winter grazing practices or um, the emissions trading scheme, agriculture has exemptions from the emission trading scheme. Um, every time there's talk of things like a water tax or a red meat tax or anything that might um, hamstring the industry, it gets shot down pretty quickly. Um, we see 
the dairy industry in our schools. They had the Milk for Schools program in primary schools. They've now got the, the Kickstart breakfast from primary to high schools. Um, and we also see them influencing our um, dietary guidelines as well. So they've got massive impact socially, politically, uh, and economically as well. Fonterra, of course, is our country's biggest company. So yeah, they've got massive push and pull pretty much everywhere we look throughout society in Aotearoa. And a lot of the dairy is being exported, isn't it? So it's not just like the, the economy locally, like it's big business on a global scale. Massive business. And like we said before about the externalities, you know, we're producing all of this product and 95 is being exported, but locally we're left with all of the nitrogen rich urine, um, all of the fecal contaminants. Um, as you said, you know, st statistics from Mike Joy that he's helped us with, um, you know, cows have the effluent footprint of between nine to 14 humans. And when we think about the amount of wetlands that we've lost in Aotearoa, uh, who you know those wetlands are designed to filter that waste we've lost the majority of it around 90 percent of our wetlands our yeah our water filtration systems have just been wiped out completely um, so you can imagine that huge effluent footprint coming out of the sector um, and its incredible contribution to the degradation of our waterways just massive so i was just mm. going to say the crazy thing about all of that is that it's for a product that's not actually needed and the majority of it is made into milk powder which is shipped around the world and mostly china and made into you know processed food put into processed foods so it's just yeah. it's just so crazy on so many different levels and in the amount of coal we're burning to dry the, yeah. the the milk to turn into powder and and then i was also going to say you know we talk about 90 percent of the wetlands uh sort of you know, or at least 90 percent probably mm. a little bit more still as as time goes on but uh, the, yeah. that sort of around 84 percent of our waterways in the catchment areas polluted uh you know we've got the highest rates of of in, um, endangered species in terms of invertebrates and, and fish native fish um, or as a result of that. And then there's also the health side of things in terms of colorectal cancer and so on. So those are things we talk about regularly on the show. So it's nothing new, but I mm. think what makes it more revealing is how powerful this, this, this industry is and, and, and why. And, and, you know, it gives, it gives a reason as to why it's happening. Um, so, okay, let's move on to the documentary. And the first question I've got to ask, because it's something that as a viewer, we never appreciate. This isn't an Instagram story. You came up with the idea two weeks ago. You filmed it last week. You posted it next week. You know, give us some insight. How long ago did you conceive the idea to do this? Uh, and what inspired to do this documentary? Um, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, we started with the idea way back when we did the Cube of Truth and kind of threw it around and I remember at the time thinking oh that sounds like way too much hard work I don't want to do that because <laughs> we kind of talked about doing like a you know a kiwi conspiracy and I thought oh you know that's huge but we just we kind of went back to that idea because it needed to be done I guess um and you know Chris had been doing dairy related content on social media and we just kind of um went from there with it but yeah it was a long project and a hard project because i guess to start with we did it with well the whole way through it was a one person film crew me following chris trying to do the filming and the producing and the directing um and also yeah um limited budget we did it with ten thousand dollars the production um <laughs> obviously the rest of the film cost a lot more money but the actual shooting of it was a really small budget um, yeah, and most people don't do it that way for a reason. Um, <laughs> so I've kind of found that out, you know, along the way there's a good reason why not to try and do it that way, but we managed to pull it off. So, And I believe you originally planned to cover animal agriculture in general. So why the shift specifically to dairy? I mean, obviously we've just covered some pretty horrific stats, but yeah, why hone in on dairy in particular? Um, yeah, for me... Uh, the reason to hone in on dairy was because it just affects such a broad spectrum of things. Um, we wanted to find something that we could have an impact on. And because this covers such a broad spectrum, there are a lot of other groups, a lot of specialists, a lot of advocates, a lot of farmers themselves who are frustrated with this industry, uh, who, are, who are having problems with this industry. 
you know, in terms of irrigation use, they use more water than any other sector. They more land use changes than any other sector in the past couple of decades. They're just such an incredibly powerful force in Aotearoa. We could have focused on animal agriculture generally, um, but we found that this was a topic that was on the tip of everyone's tongue in terms of barriers or issues that they were facing. And so we thought in terms of something that could make a lot of impact and something that hadn't been covered already as um, cowspiracy, for example, mainly focused on red meat consumption and the production of beef and the impact of beef farming. Um, yeah, we thought this was a bit of a gap and um, a hot topic. And yeah, for New Zealand, since we live here, um, it's our bread and butter as a country, essentially. So we thought who better to tell the story on the impacts of dairy farming uh, than a story from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I just really want to quickly follow up on something you said there. I really appreciated that in this film you actually cover a lot of different angles. So uh, particularly the interviews with the farmers because in a lot of documentaries like this they're either completely left out of the narrative or they're just portrayed as like these evil environmental polluting kind of unethical monsters. But like as you said this is a huge overwhelming system and a lot of them kind of don't see a way out of where they are now and a lot of them are depressed and miserable and it's like I really appreciated that you actually covered that angle as well just to kind of show how enormous this whole thing is. Yeah um, for me when you're thinking about solutions if your solution leaves some individuals behind it's not a good solution um, and we definitely highlighted that as a gap in terms of animal rights advocates and environmentalists when talking about things um, that they often only see it from their perspective. They're kind of forgetting that the farmers themselves are part of this big industrial system and in a strong way, they are victimized themselves. And so we wanted to be empathetic, of course, to farmers. Um, they're the ones right in the middle of this issue uh, and solutions have to align with them as well and they have to be led by farmers. Um, so we tried to include their narratives as much as we could in the film. And it's very important uh, for us to say this, and, and we say this often when we, whenever we have these kind of conversations, is that we're never here to be anti-farmers. And, and sometimes people come and kind of come across as that. Um, you know, farmers, like you say, they're part of the solution. We need farmers. We need food. It's just we all have different opinions perhaps on what we we deem food to be uh but we need to support them into transitioning into into the into the right direction so you know we want to say this because uh, you know it's important and it's important for our listeners yeah. to realize that no if, exactly like you said chris they're part of it they're not to be excluded and they're certainly not to be we're not here to be up against them they actually need that support um so yeah it's it's, it's important to put it out there Let's talk a bit, a little bit about the behind the scenes. Amy, you mentioned ten thousand dollars, which is not a lot when you consider you got to fly around the country, rent a few vehicles, you probably got to do a bit of accommodation here and there, and then obviously your time involved. What kind of challenges did you have during the filming? Um, did you even feel threatened at any point? I mean, at some po points of that film, you know, you're going down these these little narrow farm roads and got someone behind you, someone in front of you. Did you ever feel threatened? Even I mean, what what kind of challenges did you have through this filming process? For me, I didn't I didn't feel that the danger aspect was a problem during the film because we kept it really quiet about what we were doing. Um, we deliberately flew under the radar for as long as we could. Um, obviously, the farm watch day um you know there could be an angry farmer or they do get threatened sometimes but i wasn't too worried about that i just wanted to make sure we got the right content on that day um it's easy when you're behind the camera not to worry about anything else but yeah i think that the hardest parts for me were um well first off the industry not participating found that quite frustrating to start with the fact that frontier and dairy and said just you know, wouldn't talk to us, and um, but in the end, their silence kind of spoke for itself. So, um, you know, it turned out okay for the film, but it would have been nice for us to actually sit down and and you know get some answers directly from them. Um, I guess the next part was the research, which was quite huge. That was a big challenge for us all involved, and I want to shout out to Nikki Taylor and Nicholas Carter also. Um, for helping out with the research 
And then the editing itself, oh. <laughs> I, um, I remember someone saying to me, oh, you know, you've done the easy part, now it's the hard part. And I thought, no, surely it's going to be a lot easier now, now that we've finished shooting. But, yeah, I mean, pandemic and homeschooling and all of that thrown into the mix, it was, like, not an easy process. Um, we had over 100 hours of footage. We had to leave certain people out completely um, and trying to just make a compelling story that's like eye-opening and entertaining as well as including all this information. It was just that, that challenge of getting the balance right between information and entertainment as well. So, um, yeah, it was, it was all quite a challenge, but I think we did okay with what we had. Had you finished filming most of your shots by the time the pandemic hit? Yeah, we'd pretty much done everything except for, I think, the interview with Susie, um, maybe a couple of other small things. So we were lucky in that way. But, um, yeah, like I say, homeschooling and trying to edit a feature documentary <laughs> doesn't really work too well. <laughs> Gosh, 100 hours, I'd be able to get it down to maybe 98. But, yeah, to make those decisions <laughs> to get it down to 90 minutes, I think, around about yeah. there is, is, and, is I mean, fitting. We should also thank at this stage Annie um, Collins, who's a legendary film editor who who kind of worked with me. And basically she was just an amazing sort of guide to kind of, you know, really find the strong points. So I, I kind of had a very clear idea. Well, we both had a clear idea because of, you know, Chris and I, because of being inspired by Casperacy. So we did have that vision. But it was great to have a really experienced editor, um, you know, help guide the thought process around the editing to start with. Chris, now you, you know, Amy hides behind the lens, um, which you find is a common theme with a lot of filmmakers we interview. Um, but you're also a little bit more out there in terms of your advocacy work. So, you know, people would know who you are a little bit. Uh, oh, Chris, who do I? Yeah, you know, anti, anti-dairy. Um, did you find that a challenge perhaps? I mean, you know, in terms of perhaps getting interviews or... or um, or, you know, when, when you're out filming, you know, do you think perhaps people would recognize you? Did you ever feel that? Um, you know, as Mike Joy says, you know, sometimes it feels like he's, he's got a target on his back. Um, mm. Did you feel that at, at any point? Uh, to a degree. I mean, yeah, I've been outspoken about the dairy industry for a while. Um, and I have, you know, I've been known as that guy who's agitating old Fonterra a little bit. Um, and so there were some instances speaking with some dairy farmers where I was a little bit anxious just at the thought that they knew me from surface level things. Um, I, I always hope that when people look into my activism, especially with this film, um, that they understand uh, that we're coming from a compassionate space and that we're trying to find solutions to work with everybody. I'm not trying to demonize farmers. I'm happy to work with farmers. And so there were some instances, instances where I was a little bit worried that someone might just see me as that, you know, ignorant vegan dickhead. Um, but after this film, I think people will understand that we have nothing but the best intentions, especially for Kiwi farmers. Um, but yeah, I have, for example, considered taking the vegan stickers off of my van. Um, the other day we were filming an interview uh, and we had a drone up in the air that a farmer was not happy about. Uh, and he came up to my van, took some, some photos of my number plate and whatnot. Uh, um, so yeah, there's a little bit of anxiety there, but you know, we really believe in the message and getting it out there, which is more important than any potential backlash we might face. So as we said before, you, you do cover a lot of angles in this documentary. So without giving too much away, what are some of the key messages that you want people to take with them after watching this? For me, for me, it's definitely that, that whole thing of a, a lot of people think that we're, we, this industry exists because it's a necessity, that we have to have dairy products for humans, um, you know, for, their, for human health and for the economy and, and that kind of thing. So there's this sort of illusion that we need it, but we're causing all this devastation to the environment and, and to animals and to human health. Um, yeah, there's just no valid reason for it. Um, and it does impact all of those things. Yeah, there's, there's nothing that is positive that comes out of this industry. Um, I guess that's my, you know, my when I drive through the countryside now everything has changed like I, I just see 
all the farms completely differently. It should be native forests and wetlands and native species and it's just it's really opened up my eyes a lot more to what's happening in this country and also around the world and other countries. Mm, yeah, it definitely has a, a hero status, the dairy industry. And we're just encouraging people that all of this information that they're fed from the industry, it benefits the industry. They set the narrative. And so we're trying to provide that opposite side of the coin so people can make a more informed decision. It's about encouraging people to be aware uh, and to understand that there are very powerful forces out there who are trying to maintain the status quo, which may not necessarily work for the rest of Aotearoa. Yeah, I should add to that that it's not just about pointing out the, the problems. We also wanted it to be really solutions focused and and show that there are alternatives. We don't need to be doing this. It's a very easy um, thing in a lot of ways um, to make these changes that, that we can make. So as long as we get government support and, and people kind of making the right decisions, um, there's a pretty easy way out and a, a much better future. So talking about solutions, um, I was particularly a little bit surprised that you focused on, and I don't want to drop any spoiler alerts here, so I won't mention what it is, uh, but you focused on one particular solution when I would have thought perhaps you would have explored other um, solutions. And by that, I mean, and I found this out by accident, that um, lentils or legumes in general used to be grown in the Canterbury region. Um, and also, obviously, we know that sheep farming was quite prominent in the area before it became dairy country so why did you um when you looked at solutions you only presented the one um you can choose whether you want to give this away or not we want people to watch the film but why did you was there a reason why you focus on just one solution as opposed to perhaps others was it a time constraint thing with the film that you just had to cut it out and say let's just put one in and it's pretty global or whatever the case is i mean what was the thinking behind that I would actually disagree that we focused on one solution because um, we kind of did look at what a couple of different farmers were doing, well, three different, you know, dairy farms that were either transitioning or had transitioned. So we we did cover like three different um, solutions for the use of the land, I guess. And we also looked at a different, you know, alternative way of making dairy protein, um, which is potentially a solution that's still got its downsides of being dairy protein, but it's um, if the world is going to demand it, then it's a better way to give it to the world. So we, I think we did try to give a bit of an overview of different ways to use the land and also another way to create the same protein that people want at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically it was down to, I think, who we could go and interview, who was available and who was keen to talk to us. Um, but yeah, there were three different um, crops being grown by those different people. Well, at least three. And I would, just want, I would say, you know, we've got so many oppor opportunities, um, so much potential. I didn't even know about this lentil potential that you're talking about, Ben, but it sounds amazing. But, you know, we've got a massive... Um, potential oat industry coming up in Southland, um, which would have been a, a great thing for us to talk about as well. But like Amy mm. said, um, it was about availability, who was keen and just simply what worked out. But for me, um, the focus should be that, you know, this is such uh, an abundant, um, our, our whenua is so abundant of natural resource. Um, we could go any direction that we want. It just depends on, you know, picking something and going with it. Um, uh, the the message that I want everyone to go home with is to question the current dominant industry and start looking at other alternatives, whatever it may be. The door is there for us to walk through it if we want. We have the um, the natural resources um, to do so. Um, but yeah, we need to find better ways, more efficient ways of, of spending those resources. And they're there. And I think that's a really important point that you touch on, that this information is translatable to countries outside of New Zealand. So while this documentary is very uh, specific to the New Zealand dairy industry, 
how is this relevant to everyone else in the world? So like, for example, why should we over the ditch in Australia care about this message? I think because we're including health as a, as a major thing that, um, you know, obviously that affects people around the world. Um, and then climate affects people around the world and basically the environmental issues and the animal suffering issues are all global. Um, there is obviously a lot of New Zealand information in there, but it is pretty much the same in most countries or worse. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's valid for international audience. Yeah, and everyone wants to keep producing and consuming dairy products. And Aotearoa New Zealand is often considered the most sustainable producer of these products. And so our goal, among many, was to show that the country that is purporting the most sustainable dairy products still has all these XYZ externalities that are causing so much harm. So despite all of the talk about this incredible sustainable system, when done in the best possible way, it's still inherently unsustainable, which is a message that I think will translate for the dairy industry across the globe. If the most sustainable, supposedly, country can't do it, then, yeah, no one can, essentially. I think it helps people uh, be better educated for, for wherever they live, you know, and say, you know, it opens their eyes and it actually gives them the ability to question um, and say, well, hang on, if that's not working for them, maybe I need to start, no, start looking into my own industry. You know, how's mm. that affecting the environment? And um, Emma and I just recently presented at the Doctors for the Environment conference and, and we presented some slides on the impact of nitrate levels in our waterways, but also when digging a little deep, the same thing's happening in Australia. And it may not oh. necessarily be from dairy, uh, but it's the same output in terms of, you know, fertilisers. Um, yeah. overuse of fertilizers and, and the way we're using the land. So there's still, if it's not dairy, there's still the overarching message. So to finish off on the film itself, any personal reflections? You've, you've done the filming, you've, you've produced it, you've put it together. Anything you wish you did a little bit differently or wish you didn't do or anything like that? The only thing I wished we'd done differently, which was a bit out of our control due to the, the budget situation, was just having more time filming because a lot of the time we were, you know, cramming in like at least two interviews in a day and as well as traveling to people. And so we had a really limited time frame for the, for the shoot, which was, um, you know, it really made it a lot harder, I think, not having just huge amounts of amazing stuff to draw from like the interviews were great but yeah we had to really condense down our shoot time um but yeah other than that i think it all went pretty much to plan i want to really quickly butt in and say having watched it you cannot tell like this is a brilliant documentary so well done <laughs> we obviously cut yeah, out well, all those bits that look about. rushed <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well we're, we're lucky in that i mean i've done a lot of one person filming I guess like that's kind of what I do usually anyway so um it was kind of normal for me but yeah it would have been nice to have a bit more time to get a bit more coverage of some things but um yeah we've had really good compliments about the about the filming including from James Cameron which was quite mind-blowing. I don't know about things that I do differently but of course there are just so many topics that this industry impacts on so it's really it was really hard to pick what would be included mm. in um, I know it, I, Amy and our editing crew had a really hard time of picking things to leave out because there's just so much about this industry that you could include. Um, but, you know, we've only got 90 minutes and we've got to make sure that the message is um, receivable for those who are viewing it. Um, so, yeah, we could make another documentary, I think, um, still talking about issues that we weren't able to cover. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, 90 minutes, people can only take in so much. Um, and yeah, we hope it's not overwhelming in its current state, even though we could have added a lot more. I think that's kind of scary that you could still include a whole bunch of other stuff that you haven't spoken about, which yeah. which goes to show the extent of yeah. the impact that this dairy industry has. But overall, just like Emma, you know, we, we've been privileged to, to have previewed this film and, and the way you've put it together, uh, the message you're delivering, it's it's just so well put together it's it's not um it's not conflicting um chris you mentioned the word before compassionate so it, it takes a compassionate approach it takes a balanced approach and that's important you know it's i, I think it's a much more engaging documentary yeah. 
uh, in my mind. There, there's some good stuff out there, but for some audiences, it's just it's too conflicting, and, and they switch off. And I think this is the kind of documentary that people will watch to the end because it's it's well, it's factual, but it's it's just done in a way that it's okay. You know, you're engaging me in a conversation as opposed to just slamming it in my face. Um, and I think that's really a big credit to the two of you in terms of this whole journey you've gone through. So let's get down to the nitty gritty, the important bit. How can we watch this film? Depends where you are in the world, but at the moment we're having the premiere of the film at, in Christchurch on November the 6th. Um, and that's part of the New Zealand International Film Festival, which we're going to have screenings around the whole of the country. Um, but yeah, we're working with a distribution company to find out how we can release it globally. Um, that does take time. So yeah, unfortunately, it's another lesson in patience, really. We just have to sit back and wait. So it's premiering uh, 6th of November in uh, at the Isaac Theatre Royal in Christchurch. But you are showing this in, in many other parts of New Zealand, not Auckland at the moment, um, but most parts of New Zealand, fair to say, or big chunks of it? Yeah, yeah, I was really pleased when we submitted it to the festival, didn't know if they were even going to take it, and they said we'd love to have it, and we think that it needs to be screened nationwide. So, um, you know, that's a huge thing for a film with these kind of themes in it. Um, yeah, really good validation, and um, yeah, they're making sure it's getting screenings in all of the cinemas that they go to, pretty much. Brilliant. 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 And just an extra little plug for that premiere. You're also having a Q&A session afterwards with some very important people. So if you can get along, please do. Yeah, and we're going to do that as at as many screenings as we can. So um, Chris and I are going to go to, you know, quite a few, most of the screenings and do a QA. and a But yeah, Susie Cameron is going to join us for the premiere and the Wellington version as well. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so once we have all watched this film and we're motivated and we're revved up and we want to do something, how can we? How can we take action on this issue? Uh, basically, we're going to have some information on the website, but I mean, the key thing is for people to be choosing plant-based alternatives to dairy and to um, animal products in general. Uh, but yeah, we will have some sort of take action options on our website and we'll be promoting that through social media, doing a bit of an impact campaign with the film. So basically subscribe to the Milked website newsletter. You've got that one up and running already, I believe. Yeah, well, we, we basically have a sign up option, but the best thing to do is follow us on social media, share the trailer. Um, you know, we'll be updating as soon as we know what the global release situation is. So what's the focus now? I mean, it's a pretty dumb question. Obviously, promote, be at the premieres, but are you already in the back of your head starting to think part two um, or something else? Is, is, is that already is that already in motion, you know, starting to think what next next little project? Oh, well, Do you want to answer that first, Chris? <laughs> uh, are we giving away that we're doing a sequel? No. Um, <laughs> No sequel plan as of yet, but you know, uh, once this film gets out, um, I'm hoping that the narratives within the film uh, make it into other spaces, other social justice spaces, for example. I'm wanting all of our activists out there to see that this is a co-papa that essentially we can all get on board with to find solutions for everybody because this industry is causing so many issues stretching across all aspects of Aotearoa. Uh, there's room for everyone to get on board to work on campaigns for solutions. So uh, once this film is released, I'm hoping to get it in front of as many uh, change makers as possible so that we can start working on campaigns together. This isn't an issue we can tackle alone. So first, we've got to get this film in front of people so that we can start making collective plans for solutions that work for everybody. Chris, you've wrapped it up perfectly. I don't, I don't need to add anything to that. It's been an absolute privilege and delight to have the two of you on. Amy, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, much anticipated. We, we've, we've personally mentioned this to a lot of people saying there's a documentary coming out. You will need to watch. They're excited. A lot of them are going to be disappointed that they're going to have to wait. <laughs> um, but but there's there's a big audience waiting for it. And and I just want to repeat again, I think it's so powerful what you said, Chris, earlier, that compassionate approach. Um, and we, you know, that's what we want to finish off with. It's 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 not a an activism film, it's not a, a shock horror film, it's it's a it's an education film. 
you know, mm. and it's about asking the questions and making the right decisions. Um, when the right decisions, really, you should be able to base that off from watching this documentary. So well done to the two of you. Massive effort, uh, a fantastic film. Highly recommend it. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends. 